Good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do you have, Crystal? Indeed, we do. We got Dr. Teresa Parsi on with an update on those uh, indirect negotiations with Iran, some really significant and potentially encouraging developments there. We've got Ken Klippenstein on. He's got a horrific report of allegations of sexual assault coming out of the military. But we wanted to start with the one and only Joe Manchin throw another monkey wrench into the politics here. That's right. So the senator took to the Washington Post to write an op-ed. Let's put this up there on the screen. Joe Manchin, I will not vote to eliminate or weaken the filibuster. Now, it's not that any of this is particularly new, but I think what the most important part of the op-ed is actually what he had to say about reconciliation. So he says, quote, unfortunately, our leaders in the Senate fail to realize what goes around comes around. We should all be alarmed at how budget reconciliation is being used by both parties to stifle debate around major issues. I simply do not believe budget reconciliation should replace regular order in the Senate. How is that good for the future of this nation. So, Crystal, what does that tell us? Throwing a massive wrench into the process as the Biden infrastructure plan moves forward, and more importantly, Chuck Schumer's plans. He went ahead and got the Senate parliamentarian to consult her star charts <laughs> and decide that two reconciliations are allowed. So, there are two ways to read this. He both is planting a flag, trying to be like, yeah, I'm tough and I'm not going to do the filibuster. It could be a negotiation tactic. Yeah. The other side is he means what he says. I, I genuinely don't know which way to read it. If I had to guess, I think you're probably there. I think you said this yesterday, which is that it's likely he probably still goes along with the reconciliation process, but he is trying to milk it for all that he possibly can in order to just get arbitrary stuff like lowering the corporate tax rate. Yeah, that's uh, to me, that's how I read this as right. well. I mean, his comments on the filibuster are kind of consistent with what he said in the past. But remember, he had opened the door to some revisions. Mm -hmm. He kind of softened, it seems like, his stance, saying, hey, maybe I could go with a talking filibuster. Mm -hmm. This op-ed seems to pretty much take all of that off the table. Yeah. And then he goes that step further and is like, mm, I'm not even sure about this reconciliation process. We'll have to see. Right. I think it is posturing because then he has leverage. He gets to play that Willie won't he game. Maybe I'm not even going to go along with this process at all in order to extract whatever random bad concessions that he wants mm -hmm. out of the Biden administration. So you can see he's already posturing in that regard. And at the same time, I mean... Biden, to me, with this infrastructure bill, is playing it very much like Democrats always play it, which is before they even announce their proposal, they've already negotiated themselves down yes. without facing any pressure whatsoever. So he comes out of the gates with only two trillion when he campaigned on seven and Joe Manchin had even said, I would four. go for four. <laughs> of course, progressives want 10 or 11. Um, so he comes out of the gates with half of what even Joe Manchin said he was willing to do and saying you know, these tax cuts and things, the, these tax hikes for rich people and corporations that I've thrown in there, eh, I'm open to negotiation on it. We can mm -hmm. see what we want to do with it. So he's essentially already capitulating to the Joe Manchin position. Let's take a listen a little bit to what Joe Biden had to say about this. In the next few weeks, the vice president and I will be meeting with Republicans and Democrats to hear from everyone. And we'll be listening. We'll be open to good ideas and good faith negotiations. But here's what we won't be open to. We will not be open to doing nothing. Inaction simply is not an option. And so the other piece here, and, and this was actually a Wall Street Journal catch, a lot of even his tax proposals have already been mm -hmm. watered down. So part of what is being proposed here is a minimum corporate tax so that they can't get away with using all of these loopholes to pay absolutely nothing. Well, what he campaigned on and what he's suggesting here are wildly different. What he campaigned on would have affected something like 1,100 American companies. <laughs> what they're instituting here would affect 45, 45, just 45 companies in the entire country. So it's another like sort of virtue signaling thing. Now, the one thing I will say on the other side is, as we've discussed here, corporate tax rate, the like, yes. the sort of like on its face corporate tax rate is kind of irrelevant. So if the only thing that gets knocked down is the corporate tax rate from 28 to 25, and this was all kind of a show to let Joe Manchin demonstrate how moderate he is and how he stands up to his own president, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and that's really kind of the only concession, it's actually not 
the critical piece because no corporations pay that anyway. That's right. I, it, the entire thing, I've been saying this all week, it drives me nuts whenever we talk about taxes because all, all of this is posturing, which people go into the mat around 25 or 28. When people pay zero, it doesn't matter. Right. And especially whenever it comes to the loophole. And the way that Biden frames this, and, and Richard Rubin, he wrote that Wall Street Journal piece, probably like the preeminent tax reporter, really got his hands around, which is that He's watered it down to a position which does not actually raise that much revenue. And then the way that Biden talks about this also drives me nuts because he's yeah. like posing himself as some sort of class warrior. Let's take a listen to what he said and I'll talk about the reality on the other side. I hear anybody hollering in this recovery, the so-called before we, I became president, this K-shaped recovery where billionaires made 300 billion more dollars during this period. Where's the outrage there? I'm not trying to punish anybody, but damn it. Maybe it's because I come from a middle-class neighborhood. I'm sick and tired of ordinary people being fleeced. He's sick and tired of proposing a plan which is supported by the richest man in the world. Like, come on, okay? Like, let's stop pretending here. Amazon is supporting the corporate tax rate hype because they don't pay any corporate tax rate. We even covered, and uh, we have a clip that will air, I believe, on Friday, about how we even had, what, the top 44 companies were actually paid $3 billion right, by the federal right, government right. in federal rebates. None right. of this has anything to do <laughs> with capturing any of the real value of the billion air system and there is a reason that the world's richest people actually support this plan because on balance they will probably benefit from it and that's just what the reality is here around this entire ridiculous conversation around taxes the only way to actually go after to, uh, actual wealth in this country is to target the financial system they are not doing that and you can actually see what's happening in new york state right now where they are raising two billion dollars worth of revenue or so which is still not that much compared to what exactly is floating around up there and there's a huge outcry in yeah. new york state because of that you want to see what real targeting of power works? Even Cuomo, because their state is flat broke, was like, all right, man, you guys got to pay well, he something kinda, here. Well, he's kind of in a like, tough spot right yeah, at the he's moment in a as very, well. <laughs> very tough spot. But this is the kabuki theater of it all, which is ever, all of us pretending that this giant fight over the corporate tax rate means anything. This is not structurally changing anything with the American tax code. It is not targeting real centers or powers of wealth. Republicans, of course, are still going to go to bat as if it is. Right. And then the Democrats and them are going to negotiate it down and nothing is going to fundamentally change as Biden promised us from the beginning. So I just feel very gaslit by this entire debate. Yeah, there's another thing and this is kind of subtle, but I actually think it's really important. The way he's framing the pay for yeah. in this is as pay for like this is a means to an end. We're going to raise taxes here so we can pay for this over here. And he he made it very clear he wants to make sure he raises enough revenue on this side to pay for the infrastructure. So framing this all as like that the fundamental goal here is fiscal responsibility. Yeah. Well, okay, that's all fine and good. But actually, that's what leaves you open to watering down that's all right. of these provisions ultimately. Because if it's just about finding the revenue to pay for it, then it doesn't really matter if you get it from here, if you get it from there, if you get it from these companies, if it's you know not really something that's going to fundamentally shift the balance. It needs to be framed as tax hikes on rich people and corporations as a good and an end in right. itself. That's right. When you have such a radically unbalanced economy that it is actually a threat to our society and to our democracy, that's how this needs to be looked at. This is not just like, let's find the pennies under the couch cushion so we can pay for the infrastructure structure that we need. No, these ta type of tax hikes should actually be about rebalancing the economy. And the fact that it's not framed that way makes it, it really leaves them open to be much less than what they should be and ultimately be watered down, which is why you see him getting away with proposing something that is so wildly less than what he proposed when he yeah. was running for president. The framework, the mental framework that you use for this is incredibly important because if you use that one, it's just so incorrect. As I said here, there is a better argument for not raising a dime in federal revenue to pay for the infrastructure yeah. plan than there was for COVID relief and COVID stimulus. In this plan, there is no such thing that better qualifies for deficit spending except infrastructure. If you're gonna talk about something that has a 
multiplier effect to the tune of hundreds of billions. This is what it looks like. Think about the Eisenhower highway system. How much did it cost? Like 5.4 billion? How many hundreds of trillions of dollars have been created right. because of manufacturing, distribution costs, human capital being able to move across, people being able to visit, conduct business. I can go on forever. Like they're right. literally innumerable good externalities that come from it. And this is the same thing. And so even pretending that you have to pay for it is ridiculous. The entire point of taxation, whenever you start to understand deficits and the way that deficit spending can stimulate the economy, is in order to rebalance structural inequities within the system for the sake of, of rebalance itself. Right. Otherwise, you get gaslit by people like Bezos and Joe Manchin, mm -hmm. and other people that you have to pay for it with this way or that way, instead of being like, no, it's actually bad. Jeff Bezos made a hundred billion extra dollars while everybody else got a lot less poor. That seems bad. Let's right. fix it. Right. There you go. So. Yeah, that's exactly it. I don't really care yeah. if the infrastructure bill is paid for. You don't have to care. And it by, framing it, by yeah. framing it that way, you're buying into this mm -hmm. deficit hawk mentality of we've got this finite reason, just this amount in the budget, and you can't spend more than that, and we got to make sure it's balanced. And that's just not true, and it's not the way that the government behaves when it comes to dishing out money to rich people in the military-industrial complex. So I don't like the framing. I don't like the talking point. I'm not impressed with the size of the infrastructure package. I'm not impressed with the posture out of the gates of, like, what he said is... Uh, debate is welcome. Compromise is inevitable. Mm. Changes are certain. So coming out of the gates, like, here's my opening bid, but you guys just go ahead and tear it apart and make it a lot less than what it is. Right. Not exactly the strongest place to start, especially when what you've already offered is kind of inadequate, much less than what he campaigned on. Yeah, yeah. good point. We're going to tell you what's on our radar, so that's next.